Welcome to our webinar this evening. Um, as you can see, we're going to talk about improving mental strategies for athletic performance. Um, and I am thrilled to have back this week um, my amazing co-host, Q Banks, who is a strength and conditioning coach at Ohio State and is going to be the DJ for next time because I'm getting all kind of smack talk from the panelists. Um, but for many of you... Yeah, many of you who may have joined us last time, um, Q currently is our strength and conditioning coach for men's basketball, as well as our spirit squad at Ohio State, and has a big interest in supporting wellness um, through sport. And so I'm thrilled to have you back, Q. We're going to have a great time tonight. Thanks, Sam. And y'all also must know Dr. Samantha Bates. Uh, Sam is a professor here in the College of Social Work here at The Ohio State University. So we'll go ahead and roll right into yeah. Sam. Yeah, and I also, just so everybody knows, Sydney Mack is on the call. Sydney, can you just say a quick hello so they see you on their screen? Hi, everyone. If you have any tech issues tonight or as you're thinking of questions for our amazing panelists, um, go ahead and chat them uh, to me and yeah, just let me know what you need. Awesome. Thanks, Sid. And Sydney's an amazing member in our doctoral program, also with an interest um, in student-athlete wellness. So to kind of get us going today, we're going to watch the Steph Curry, you know, shooting here on our screen. As you can see, Steph made 150 three-pointers as of recent. And today, as we talk about mental strategies for improving athletic performance, nobody does it better than Steph Curry in terms of routines and practice. So as you're listening today, we're going to hear from our amazing panelists who will intro in a second just the importance and significance of these types of strategies to help our student athletes be successful in sport. Um, in addition, we also have a picture here of Naomi, Naomi Osaka, who has come out and talked openly about her performance anxiety and conversations about, you know, her nervousness and the need to kind of talk and, and regulate her emotions before she gets on the tennis court. And so these two athletes are open and talking about, you know, whether it's preparation and routines or ways and, and needs regarding um, emotional regulation. And so these kind of frame the importance of what's happening in sport. I also want to cue you to some uh, Ohio data that we have on how many coaches wanted this training. Over 80% of Ohio coaches want to learn more about things like mental imagery, as well as how to reduce performance anxiety, and um, how to strengthen their student athletes' kind of mental toughness when it comes to prepping for competition. So that's kind of our why today as we get going, and Q's going to talk to us about our game plan, and then we'll get to our amazing panelists. Yeah, so go ahead and hit the next slide, Slip. Yeah, so today for our webinar, we'll talk about a, a lot of different things. So four of them will be, first thing, we're going to describe the importance of mental strategies. Like what, what's the importance of actually providing these tools to our student athletes, as well as what's the importance of preparing the coaches to improve that performance. We'll get into the increasing awareness and importance of student athletes uh, of getting into a flow state. Everybody wants to know how to get into the zone. Like what is... What, what are steps I can take to get into that flow state where everything becomes slow and easy? Um, another point we'll touch on today is expanding your knowledge, your behavioral strategies or your toolbox uh, per se, by building confidence and competence in those student athletes. And then finally, we'll look at cognitive strategies, um, expand that toolbox even more on emotional regulation, how to keep athletes and coaches in an emotional stable condition as we move forward. So we'll, we'll use some mental imagery, um, some mindfulness, and we'll teach athletes some positive self-talk and anxiety uh, reduction strategies. Awesome, thanks Q. All right, it's time to introduce the Dan Gold. Take it away, Q. Yeah, Dan is a, uh, a emeritus professor here, at, well, not here, but at that other school that we don't like to talk about, but uh, <laughs> Michigan, State, Michigan State University in the College of Kinesiology. Um, Dan has been a consultant for the U.S. Olympic Committee, the United States Tennis Association, as well as several student athletes at multiple levels. Um, his er areas of expertise include mental training and athletic uh, competition. 
Yes. And for any of you who know, Dan Gold wrote the book on Sports Psych. It's the one we've all read. I think it's on its fifth edition, right, Dan, or something. Just keep updating it and helping practitioners, researchers, and scholars, as well as coaches and athletes just learn the newest knowledge and research out there. So amazing to have you, Dan. I'm going to intro um, Dr. Don Anderson Butcher, who's here on the call. Um, Don is a full professor in the College of Social Work at Ohio State University. She has a PhD in exercise and sports psychology from the University of Utah. Utah just beat that USC this week, getting ranked up there. Um, she's also been a coach of soccer and is a, you know, amazing mental health expert as well in our college and advocate for the ways that sport can teach life and social skills. And so we're thrilled to have Dawn here also, who's one of the leaders of the Coach Beyond Project. And so it's fabulous to have you as a panelist. All right, Q, who's our last amazing guest? Yeah, I think everybody's going to be excited about this last guest. It is Jesse Mirko. Jesse's a second-year scholar athlete here at Ohio State University, where he's majoring in sport industry. You may know Jesse as the punter for the Ohio State football team, um, but he actually came to Ohio State from Pro Kick Australia, um, where he was coached by Nathan Chapman and John Smith in the art of punting. And fun fact, I've also heard that Jesse would like to get into ownership at the NBA level upon postgraduate. Nice. All right. So we might be able to get him some exposure tonight here on our webinar. There you go. There you go. All right. Awesome. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to stop sharing here and just open it up as a conversation. So three of you, thank you for being here. Q's going to kick us off with our first question, but we can't say thanks enough. So Q, take it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this first question for our panelists is really simple. Why? What is your why for being here today? And let's talk about the importance of focusing on mental strategies uh, when you're playing or when you're coaching sports. So let's break it down. Like, what's the why behind being here? Dan, do you want to kind of kick us off there? Sure. Um, I got into this whole field uh, because of my experience as a high school and college athlete. And I remember being a football captain in high school and not knowing how to deal with guys who weren't as motivated as they should be and mm -hmm. I didn't know how to handle that and then in, in wrestling I got a little nervous in college I didn't choke but I never performed quite as well as I'd want and it wasn't enjoyable so I went into the field to try to understand and learn things to help other people so their sport experience is more enjoyable and I think the other is I've had really great opportunities to see some of the best coaches in the world and it, about and how they develop athletes mentally and the flip side i've seen some pretty terrible coaches at it and you know how do we get more coaches being those great coaches to help people grow and develop yeah that's big that's big jesse you want to touch us on or kind of teach us on your why on mental strategies when you're playing at yeah, a high um, level with ohio state <laughs> Uh, as an athlete, like a college athlete, student athlete at the moment, I'm a bit of an older guy being from Australia, coming over. Um, I see a lot of younger guys um, experience like performance anxiety, stuff like that, stuff that I experienced when I was younger playing football in Australia. Um, so I don't know, I feel like I I just have that experience and and some techniques and ways that I, I guess, grew and, and learned how to deal with stuff like that, that I can yeah, pass on to some of the younger guys. I love That's that. Awesome. Pay it forward. That's a good one. Don, what about you? Your why? Well, I like Dan was a um, pretty uh, competitive soccer player as a youth. And when I look back at my experiences in sport and on the soccer field, I really had some really positive developmental experiences and great coaches. And then other times I had, there were a lot of missed opportunities where perhaps my coaches or the team experience could have been more actualized. And so I've sort of spent my career looking at, at how sport can be beneficial to young people and how we can construct it in different ways to get other kinds of outcomes um, and play a little bit in this mental performance area. So I'm excited to, to be here tonight with everyone. Yeah, it's awesome. I heard a couple different whys. So we have a nice array here. We've got kind of the, I was curious, the Dan of performance and then, you know, Jesse, your pay it forward. If I can learn something and, and give it back, I think that's an amazing thing in sport. And Dawn just saying there's tons of missed opportunities. And so how can we kind of leverage those things in sport? I like it. Um, okay, to all of our panelists, what are some of the fundamental aspects of participation in sport? 
that student athletes really need to understand to kind of reach their peak performance. Um, and Dan, I'm going to start with you on this one, because this is kind of right in your wheelhouse. What would you say are some of those things that help athletes reach that peak level? Yeah, I, I think one thing is just, it sounds silly, but work on your mental game. Don't just assume it's going to happen. Uh, a friend of mine, Sean McCann, who's like been at 10 Olympics as a sports psychologist, in one of some of his writings, he, he had something like a great mental game won't win you a championship, but a weak mental game will guarantee that you lose it. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, physical ability, other things get in, but uh, you need a good mental game this day and age, and, and you need to work on your mental game. And, you know, classic coaches, I remember when I was a kid, they tell me to relax, but they never tell me how, which yeah. isn't very helpful, or, you know, yeah. be more positive. So I think today's coach, we have a lot more knowledge, needs to be very intentional and teach very specific things to their athletes and help their athletes discover like when Jesse talked, what works for them? I mean, it's not like we know all the answers. It's helping Jesse find the answers that he has inside. Mm, I like that. So the work on your mental game, but we also have to teach coaches and athletes the how to do those types of things. You mentioned a couple of things I'm sure you'll share. We have some targeted questions for you later to maybe give us some of those practical things. But I like what you said too about Jesse kind of maybe finding his own unique thing that's his mental game and then sharing that with other athletes, learning from each other. So Jesse, what do you think? What are some of the things that you've noticed as a high-performing student athlete that helps you get in that peak performance state or get ready for high performance? Yeah, um, similar to Dan, I guess, like just letting athletes understand that you are going to fail. Um, there's going to be mistakes. Um, I mean, coaches might not be happy in the moment. Players aren't happy in the moment as well, I guess, but more so learning how to deal with those mistakes and making sure you don't make those twice um, is probably the biggest thing for me. It's just, yeah, like, I mean, failure is going to happen, but you need to yeah, be able to understand how to deal with that rather than yeah, getting in a worse mental state from putting too much pressure on yourself. I like that. So almost the getting myself bouncing back after there's been a challenge or yeah. a hardship is a big part of this mental game for you. I like that. Yeah. Um, we'll ask you a little bit more about that because it can be really hard not to spin into a lot of negative self-talk. Um, Don, anything you want to add there as we're thinking about athletes getting ready for, for high performance? I, I guess I just think part of it is just owning what sport is, right? It's competitive. It's meant to have some level of arousal and, and a little bit of anxiety to be a peak performer. Um, and so, you know, normalizing that. And then I think going back to that idea of, you know, you're going to have a bad shot. You're going to have um, a poor um, game. You might have a loss, right? And then how do you learn from that and move forward from it? Because that's part of what sport is, winning and losing, right? Or um, missing uh, opportunities. So um, I think just normalizing that is a really important thing that a coach can do and not putting too much on the loss or, or the poor performance and letting them be lessons learned. Yeah, I love that. Using everything as an opportunity to learn. And then, you know, that normalization of this is both scary and kind of exciting, right? Like the big game is, you know, fear. What if this happens when I get out there? But also it's equally exciting. What if we win? And so we do a lot of those what ifs that that get us into fear and excitement and, um, you know, normalizing some of that. That's that's important for the arousal state. That's awesome. OK, Q, you're up. Yeah, Dr. Gould, I have a question for you here. Let's talk about preparation. What are some of the foundational strategies coaches can use to prepare athletes for competition? Yeah, um, I, I guess the first point I thought of is if I'm a coach and I think about preparing them the day before a competition, I'm in trouble. I should think <laughs> about preparing them the day we start practice. Um, and I just, as, as Jesse talked, I thought of actually who's a great coach sports psychologist, Ted Lasso, if you've seen that uh, that program. And, you know, it's like be a goldfish because it has such a memory. And he talks about that to the athletes early on, then yeah. reminds them in big games. I mean, it's not a technique per se. But to me, coaches need to plant seeds and then reinforce it over time. And it doesn't have to be very complicated, you know, and then remind athletes. So a good one is just if we pick up on the anxiety that we we're talking about that you're going to be anxious sometimes. And I, I always like quotes. There's a, a great quote from our field. A guy named Terry Orlick said it. It's not whether you have butterflies that's a problem. It's whether they're in the right formation. 
Absolutely. And if you're a young athlete and you're starting to feel real big butterflies, it's like, okay, but are they in the right formation? And, and some guys and gals need to be a little nervous to do well and others need to be more laid back. And, and a big one for coaches I find is uh, we're always talking about build good fundamental relationships with your athletes and then learn about each athlete. And you're, and we find most coaches aren't very good mind readers. So how I'll use Jesse because he's on, but what does Jesse like to be treated before in a game, pregame? Does he like to distract himself with music or does he like to go in the equipment room and do imagery? You know, what's it like? And, and every athlete's going to be a little different. And I think coaches can figure that out. And actually football and basketball are great examples because you have that individualization, but then you also come out to the field together. So on yeah. one hand, you've got to integrate that in. But I'd say plant seeds and, and sort of move forward and remind athletes. It's much easier to tell them something in the big game if you've been telling them the same thing all year long. Um, yeah, that, that would be one. We can be more specific later. No, that's really good. Actually, I wanted to kind of jump into um, maybe a little bit more specific, like advanced techniques that have been shown to prepare athletes mentally for athletics. What have you seen there? Yeah, one of the biggest things I've seen right now, and I'm always leery because I don't know what coaches are listening, but is the whole idea of pressure training. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of research now that shows athletes who bet better deal with stress perform under stress in practice. So coaches create stressful situations. Well, I should backtrack. First, as a coach, I give the athletes some coping strategies. I teach them mindfulness or breathing or positive self-talk. And then I tell them, so I'll use Jesse because he's on the call. Jesse, we're going to put you under pressure today. And we're going to yeah. do it this by doing this. And, and, and if you don't do it right, we're going to have a, a punisher. Are you okay? You know, so it's, it's not like I'm just coming out of nowhere with that. Yeah, and so then we prepare. have him punt under pressure. And try, you, know, you never can, the horseshoe, you never can replicate what he's going to feel in the horseshoe but you can get them used to dealing with pressure. And that's probably one of the things I see right now, a lot of work being done around the world on pressure training and how to do this and do it without breaking an athlete. Because if you're not very good at it, it can cause burnout. It can break an athlete down. So it's really more nuanced than maybe the old stereotype football coach would have it or basketball coach. It sounds a little bit like in a container, right? So you give them tools to cope. You kind of tell them and, and set the expectation this period of time is going to be your pressure. And then kind of at the end, there's a, how was that for you? What did we learn? Kind of what Don was saying. So it's a little bit of kind of what you all were, were sharing as your strategies and why. Yeah, that's a great summary. Sometimes you could think of it as inoculation. Mm -hmm. We get a COVID inoculation to, you know, to give us a little bit of COVID so our antibodies build up. So I teach you some stress things and then I put you in situations to allow your antibodies to build up. So hopefully in the big, big situations, you'll, you'll be ready for it. Yeah. So it's kind of this pressure training by fire in a sense. Yeah. I like that one. Okay. I'm going to pass to Jesse, Dan, so we can see if this is kind of happening with him. It, and it his really works. <laughs> yeah, tell us, Jesse. So, Jesse, what are the things that your coaches have done or taught you over the years to help you prepare mentally for your performance in sport? Uh, yeah, I guess similar to what Dan just said as well. It's putting us in the, the worst possible situations. Um, for me, with punt, it's a pretty specific skill. Um, I mean, there's games where I don't punt. There's games where I kick the ball a couple of times. Like, um, But where I practice, um, I'll probably have – a normal day I'll have six punts, like two racks of three, I guess. Um, and those, the, the pressure we bring and like the the look I get and the it's, it's just so much worse than you could ever imagine in a game um, to the point where as a as an athlete, yeah, it can be frustrating at times because you're like, damn, this is like next level. Like I don't, it's nothing like this in a game, but then you do get to game day, you step on the field and uh, I mean, it's, yeah, it feels easy in comparison is like the best way to put it. Um, so I feel like that's definitely one way, um, like with punt specifically again, uh, coach day, obviously is a pretty important guy. He'll stand on my shoulder, like almost touching me during pump period. And he'll, um, yeah, just, that just adds a little bit of extra pressure. 
you get on the field on game day, there's no one around. It's, it feels more relaxing. Um, I mean, the rest of the staff and, and other players are, are all huddled around as well in pump periods. So it feels kind of confined. And like I said, you get on game day, you get on the field and it's it's so much more space. It feels more free. It, it's just less stressful environment. Um, we also do pump a lot of crowd music sometimes. Like I hold on field goal uh, and extra point and stuff as well, where I have to, I have to say cadence to get the ball snapped. Um, so oftentimes, like especially if we're going on the road, they'll they'll pump a lot of crowd music to the again to the point where it's it's unrealistic almost. But um, we get that work at yeah the worst possible situation, and um, I guess you get out on the field. Like we we had a game winner in the Rose Bowl last year. It's a pretty heavy um, heavy environment with music uh, with like crowd noise and, and whatnot. But I mean instincts and you just your training kind of takes over, and you don't really think twice about it while you're out there. It just kind of happens. So. Uh, they definitely make it as tough as possible. And it can be frustrating, but definitely yeah, can can help when you get to game day. I like that. You said two things. One, it can be frustrating as an athlete. So I think yeah. it's good that you said that because coaches can be prepared to say, this is going to be frustrating, right? It's going to feel really hard. You're going to say, why do we have to do this? But I like that you said, but then I get out there and I realize, oh, that's almost a walk in the park compared to practice. And co- yeah. oh my gosh, I can't imagine having coach on your shoulder, right? But yeah. in some ways it, it's creating, like Dan was saying, in a container, giving you that stress so that when you get out there, you could do it with coach day on your. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely like, again, I, I punt specific for me, but uh, we, we do a lot of situational work. So every Thursday practice, the exact same punt format, we kick a ball from the, the one yard line. So the back of the end zone where I, you can't move backwards, you can barely move forwards. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of other like stressful situations. So there's nothing you can face on game day that you haven't prepared for, I guess, and, and they can kind of throw you off on game day. So, Yeah, that's amazing. Thanks for sharing that because I think it's important for coaches to hear the the training and preparation that goes into it. And then when you put one on the 40, it's way better than the one yard one. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Don, anything you think to add here? You know, as we're thinking about coaches and strategies they can use um, to prepare mentally, what else should we share? I, I just have a comment. Jesse, I remember this past summer when it was like completely raining and a miserable day in Columbus and, and you had scheduled practice and you were like, I'm like, are you going? What are, why didn't they? And you're like, no, we have to go and all the elements. Yeah. And like, again, that we get wet practice. bowl practice. Yeah. yeah. You don't change yeah. it because that's actually good to be able to prepare under all the elements and practice like you might see in a game. So that was funny. Yeah. I thought, I was like, what are you doing? And you're like, Oh no, I'm, I gotta go. Um, yeah. No, I think that the other thing that I think coaches can do around sort of the, you know, creating a space for athletes to be prepared are real is really around the consistency, right? And sort of creating the, you know, the common expectations, the you know, standards for behavior, the rituals, the traditions, the um, routines, you know, kind of in the in the settings in which you do them. So it might be what we do in the preseason versus what we do midway through versus what we do when we get to tournament time. It could be what we do before a game, you know, or the week before a game or the weekend, the night before a game, right? And just these expectations and communications that coaches can do to really sort of control the conditions that aren't during the game. Does that make sense? And so um, I think that coaches can really do a lot in the way in which they communicate expectations. Um, They embed traditions and rituals and um, celebrations and planning um, that keep athletes, uh, a lot of what goes on, the noise around sporting events, um, a lot more contained and so that there's less noise, right? And so how do we teach our athletes to do those things on their own so that they can be more focused when they get to game day? So, yeah, I think that's important. The the consistency and making sure it almost becomes routine, like second nature to do these things the night before, the week, the Monday before, even Jesse was saying that Thursday practice, we know that hard stuff is coming. That's a routine. So being consistent in that way can also help prepare, prepare for what's coming mentally. That's great. Dan, something to add? Yeah, because I think one of the things where we found working with individual sport athletes and like ski team athletes, in terms of, I think there's a like a macro uh, preparation that the coach can do that, uh, that was nicely said here. But there's also like the individual mental preparation. And we did things like, how do you screw your head on for competition? You know, and again, are you off by yourself? Are you the one that tells jokes and then focus? 
But what we did, I thought that worked really well is we know athletes who perform better have consistent routines. They don't psych up extra for the big game. They, they're the same all the time. But then we would have a regular routine, your optimal routine. And then we would have a shrink routine. So if I'm a high school coach and something, the bus breaks down and we're late. How do you get ready in five minutes when you usually take 15? And then we had a stretch routine. So we're in a Don, a Don's playing soccer and there's lightning. And now we have a half hour and we need to psych ourselves up. So we always had the athletes have their ideal routine, their shrink routine, their stretch routine, and then let the coach know what it is. Because if, if, if Jesse doesn't want me telling jokes around him, because he's really serious in his focus, then I probably shouldn't be telling jokes. But if he's the kind of athlete that likes to be loose and have a few jokes, of course, he probably wouldn't want me because my jokes aren't that funny. <laughs> but, you know, we'd get a, a, somebody from Australia who's actually funny to help <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, we're going to go back to Jesse on that, Dan. That was a perfect segue. I mean, Jesse, would you mind sharing with us some of your kind of game routines? You know, what do you do before? What's kind of your strategy that you found out in getting in the right mindset um, before a game? Yeah, like Dan touched on again, um, everyone is different. Like we we got guys on the team that are pretty loud and, and out there and that's how they psych themselves up, I guess, to get ready to perform. But um, for me personally, I like I'm a bit quiet. I put my headphones in and don't really talk too much. Kind of just get ready and get ready to do my thing. Um, no like loud, crazy music or anything like that. Bit of country music normally um, calm me down a little bit. So we do that. Um, and then yeah, last spring I guess when I first um, got to high state, um, it was to work on a work on a routine, a warm up routine that I could take from practice um, and I can repeat on game day. So. I do basically the exact same routine um, every practice before I punt that I do on game day when I get to the field. Um, and then in terms of um, like staying focused and, and ready throughout the game, I guess I, um, I'm pretty specific with whenever we're on offensive drive, we get the ball. Um, I'll, I'll have two warm up like punts into the kicking net. Um, normally only two, unless I didn't feel too good, but um, I don't like to over kick. I like to keep it, um, like short and sharp, I guess. And and then once we get into like a field goal range or an extra point range, um, I take a couple of field goal snaps, like warm up snaps on the sideline with a snapper. Um, and then once we're happy, once he's happy with everything, we kind of follow follow along with the offense and, and are kind of with the offense ready to go if it gets to a fourth down and or if we score, I guess. So um, yeah, definitely, um, especially as a specialist, a lot of kickers and punters are very, very, uh, I guess like, they, they have their routines and um, a lot of people yeah, don't like being thrown off with those routines. Um, and there is times where, again, last year on the road, it's a bit different. You have less guys on the sideline um, and in pregame warmups, like we had to change my routine for some reason. I had to help out with something and it just kind of throws you a little bit. So it does definitely make a difference. So if you can account for stuff like that, um, it's always good. But yeah, trying to, trying to, yeah, I guess simulate game day at practice definitely helps for me. So. Love that. You even have it down to specific numbers, you know, hey, I'm yeah. going to do practice. And once we get in field goal, I think too, you, you talked about something that is really important here. You're engaged with the game the whole time too. So yeah. there's really no, you know, mental game, you know, Dan, as you were talking about getting that mental game ready, Jesse's in it for the entire game. And I think Jesse, you spoke to the, if I do it at practice, it feels second nature at the game. And then I don't yeah. like being thrown um, out of it. Yeah. yeah, on top of that, I guess, um, like when we do punt or when we do kick a field goal extra point, um, yeah, again, we, we don't really try and overthink it. You go out there, get the job done. And then once you get back to the sideline, that's when we kind of analyze things and, and can talk about things, look at like, I guess, numbers and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, in the moment, um, kind of just focused on doing the job and um, yeah, leave the rest to later on. Yeah, I like that. It's good. It's interesting. Many years ago, we wrote a chapter or an article for a journal called Coaching Women's Basketball. And it was really what you do as a bench player of what you're doing on the bench. Like, are you watching the people in your position? So how are you, if you're not playing very much, how are you getting ready during the game versus sitting there and, you know, looking up in the crowd? So, and, and then it's interesting because I actually ended up doing this work because I was working with a player that started her whole career. And then at the time that we were at Illinois, she didn't know how to come off the bench. 
-hmm. And yet as a freshman, she had to come off the bench. You know, so I think it's kind of interesting, like not just for the starters, but the players who are going to come in, how we might help them. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. How do we get those bench players to stay mentally checked into the game and, and work on their mental game for coming off the bench is a hard skill, right? And so there, there's learnings and things to be preparing in that regard as well. All right, Q, take us to our next question. Yeah, I think we've talked great about kind of the consistency part of it and when everything's going right and having a good routine. What happens when things go sideways? You know, Dan, Jesse, what are some relaxation techniques that you use or teach to help with performance anxiety or how to get into the flow state? What are some of the, the things that you like to do there? Dr. Gould? Okay. Um, yeah, I guess the uh, big one is that I've always used is the centered breathing and the slow, deep breath. And that's sort of a bedrock of sports psych. Like most people yeah. don't do it correctly. Um, and, you know, you ask a kid to do it. It's a big, you know, it needs to be slow and deliberate. Um, but we do it if you're working with a lot of players, they need to be doing it outside with their eyes open. Uh, a lot of times we'll have, it if they're a tennis player, we'll have them hold the racket, get into a good stance, kind of, you know, how they sway back and forth and be working on those strategies. Um, tennis does a lot of good stuff with like flush routines. I just double faulted. I go to the back of the... Uh, the court, I look at a pole, I take a deep breath. I might have some pre-positive thoughts. For many years, I, I down at Greensboro, I worked with uh, college baseball players, D1. And if a pitcher uh, threw a, a bad pitch and there's a home run, we'd talk about going to the back of the mound, or we used to call it the outhouse. And you go to the outhouse and you need to take a good flush because there's a lot of you know what in your head. Yep. And you take a deep breath and you maybe look at a flagpole and you don't come back to the pitching rubber, it's like the altar at church. You don't go back until you have good thoughts. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a whole, a, kind of a routine to deal with failure because you know failure is going to come. And how do you clear your head? And I always really liked, I got it from Ken Revis, a great sports psychologist, but this toilet flush kind of idea. If somebody goes in the bathroom before you and doesn't flush, it's growth. A lot of us build up, you know what, in our head. And we don't have very good plumbing. Really good athletes have good plumbing. They know how to flush it and get it out quick. Dawn's going, I can't believe you took us there. <laughs> we <laughs> definitely took it there. there. <laughs> we definitely took it there. <laughs> I have a whole new idea of the bathroom, right? Like. <laughs> uh, well, well, Jesse, let's hear for you. Yeah, to yeah. Yeah, toilets aside, what, what, uh, what do you like to do <laughs> to get into the flow state there? Um, I mean, self-talk, I use a lot of self-talk and visualize, uh, visualization. Um, I mean, other than that, that's more like, I guess, in the moment uh, on the field, stuff like that on the sidelines. Um, try to just, yeah, with the self-talk, I guess, especially this year, um, more so, I try to just tell myself uh, little things like, I mean, the world's not going to end if I have a bad punt. Um, it's just, that's what it is. Try and look at it like realistically that, I mean, obviously, it does mean a lot to all of us, but it is just a game, and I'm going to get another punt later on. It doesn't matter. Um, and I think that really just helps with me being able to go and execute and, and perform at my best. Um, and another one that um, actually our quarterback, CJ, um, kind of spoke to the team, I think it was before the Notre Dame game, so obviously a pretty big game to start the year. And um, he just told us all, like, something that he uses and, and I've started using um, throughout the day, like, prior to – prior to the start of the game that he um he'll watch highlights like a highlight video of himself for on the ball and, and making good plays and and now I'll watch film from practice or film from other games where I've had a good good punt or good performance and I mean visualization again you get to get to see yourself doing it and, and you can tell yourself look we, like I can do this like I do this all the time I mean I think that really yeah really helps with my performance fantastic that's awesome those are good ones. I, I think the watching the highlight film, you know, it's all positive. Don't go back and watch all the negative ones. Really see yourself yeah. being successful contributes. And then yeah. I like your self-talk. You know, we, we used to a long time ago when I was doing mental health with kids, we would have them name it. So they would call it negative Ned and positive Pat. And you could choose to listen to negative Ned, right? Or you could figure out what positive Pat would say. So it's like, 
you know, some of that too is helpful to name that negative self-talk, you know, oh, there's negative Ned again saying what he thinks is going to happen. Um, but what would positive Pat tell me right now that I could do? And there's tons of ways we can teach student athletes to kind of name that negative character or thought and kind of externalize it and say, but, but I get to choose, right. And, and pick a different mindset or self-talk. So I think that's a great one. Um, we're going to kind of keep going. Uh, Dan, when we're talking about self-talk, how do you teach self-talk to athletes? And Dawn, we'll see if you can kind of jump on here and help Dan too, because we know you have thoughts on this one that you'll share later. Yeah, I've done over my career quite a bit of like thought stopping. Yeah. And I that's a pretty common technique. But what I find is uh, a lot of people aren't specific enough. So if I'm working with a younger athlete, I'll say, you know, you miss a penalty shot in soccer or, you know, you double fault in tennis or whatever it might be. What are the negative thoughts you have? And they, well, I, I think negative, you know, like, and a lot of times they're embarrassed because I'm older to swear in front of me. So I'll say, just put XXX in, but I suck. Why am I blank blank at this game? And we get very specific thoughts because I think that is what they do. And then we have like a stop signal, could be a stoplight. It could be a red screen or, and then we have very specific replacement thoughts. Yeah, I sucked on that one, but I've come back before. And to me, they need to be very realistic. Um, I really believe in sort of the optimistic, positive stuff a, a lot. But I'm a realist. I mean, if you're, if you're having a really bad day, just pretend everything's perfect. You know, reminding yourself you've come back or you win. You know, I always talk to wrestlers, win ugly. I didn't have a really good day, but I kind of stuck around and I hung around and I hung in there. And I, I didn't go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon where my performance was going down. I, I hung around and in, in the Olympics, it may mean I, end, I dropped to a, a bronze medal, but that looks a lot better than no medal. You know, and then just sort of realizing there's situations I got to know how to react. And mm -hmm. Jesse talked, sometimes I was thinking, you know, like athletes, they need to know, like they need a fire drill. What happens when I'm not playing well? Um, sometimes we call the stoplight. Red light, you're in trouble. The coach needs to take you out. Yellow light, it could go either way. Green light, you're in the zone. Just leave you alone. What are your yellow light situations where you start to have negative thoughts? How do you calm yourself? How do you, a, a basketball player who's a really good shooter is missing all their threes. How do they kind of work through that and have the confidence to go? So I think having them be very specific with their thoughts and, and, and at the same time, realistic. I think the only thing I would add, Dan, too, is, is like use the, the miss as, as feedback, right? So like, it's not, oh, that was terrible. Like if you're hitting the tennis, tennis ball, like that was long, right? Or that was, you know, too far to the right, or I missed it over, you know, and then kind of labeling whatever the poor performance was with the feedback that you need in order to improve the next time um, can also be a way of like moving out of the, the drones of the negative and into the, um, you know, constructive kind of feedback that moves you forward and gets you moving. So um, yeah. that's, that's a real interesting point because you get into paralysis by analysis and you really, I, I love the point because you really need to learn from your feedback. But in some continuous sports, you don't have time to process it and you need to park it to later. In other right. sports, you can come in and deal with it. So I think I think that's a great point, but really kind of knowing to instruct right. our athletes how to use it productively. Definitely. Um, we're going to wrap with this question, then we're going to get to Dawn. Um, but as we think about, you know, resources that you all would suggest for our coaches on the call, you know, and Jesse, I don't know if you have something to offer to share with coaches, to share with student athletes around this topic, um, but could you too, and then we're going to pass to Dawn to share a couple more things coaches can do. Tell us a little bit about where you can go to get some additional resources on this topic. What would you recommend? Who we started? Dan, start go with ahead. Yeah, yeah. It, it 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 it's not as applied as I'd like it to be, but it's probably a lot more applied than most of our research journals. There's a journal called the Journal of Sport Psychology and Action that has a lot of good articles. There, they got a scientific base, but it's like practical things. Like I just reviewed an article: a tennis coach creating a, a an environment 
that doesn't get caught up in all the one of the questions that came through all the statistics and hoopla and rankings to how to keep that self focused. There was an article on that. That would be one. We did a book. The I think you can still get it about ten years ago. Larry Lauer, um, who's the head of mental training for U.S. Tennis, but it was mental skills and drills for tennis coaches, and it had a hundred skills and drills concentrate by area concentration, motivation, etc. Now that was for tennis, but you could take most of those and I've adapted them to wrestling, baseball, volleyball, other sports. So that might be another resource people might want to look at. That's excellent. We'll share those out with the panelists after um, and make sure that when we share this webinar back out, those are some links um, for folks to check out. So Sid and Q and I will make sure that goes out. Jesse, what do you think? Anything you would say, hey, coaches, these are resources or things you can take a look at to help your student athletes get ready to perform uh, mentally? Uh, uh, yeah, I I know at Ohio State, we have um, like counselors and stuff like that. They're always available to be uh, spoken with. Um, I know a lot of my teammates, I personally don't, but they have access to using the Calm app as well. It's like an app that can help with like sleeping and even stuff like that. Um, I know a lot of guys that, yeah, you can often like, even with performance anxiety, struggle to like get to bed and stuff like that, worrying about practice and game day. And uh, yeah, a lot of the guys use stuff like that. So that's that's about it. Yeah, I like that. The Calm app definitely being used in a lot of athletic departments across the country. Um, so the Calm app, a couple of resources shared by Dan. Don, anything you want to add there on resources for coaches before we pass to you? I mean, I would say there's sports specific um, sports psychology books, Dan, I know, for example, that there's a good golf one out there, but, you know, and, but I think like, if you look at sports specific uh, kinds of searches in Google, you'll find different ones that are out there by some of our sports psychology colleagues that have kind of drilled down tennis, they've drilled down golf, they've drilled down um, more individual sports, wouldn't you say, Dan? I mean, yeah, like a Rotella's classic book, yeah. Golf is Not a Game of Perfect. Um, right. Jim Lair's had tennis books. A, a lot of times if you you know have access to a sports psych person, you could ask them for recommended readings. There's like readings that sports psych people have done, but there's also some great coaching books. Mm -hmm. um, Irvin Meyer, when I, his book where he talks about the ritual and as you move through when he was coaching at Ohio State from a freshman to a sophomore to a junior. It was broader, but it was how to grow as a person, and it tied to some of the things we're talking about. So there's some great books like that out there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, Q, you want to pass to Dawn here and tee us off. Yeah. So it's All fun right. to do this kind of, you know, one of the things with Coach Beyond that we always try to do is, is leave with a couple of, um, you know, coaching strategies that we can leave folks with that they can go try to um try to use in practice, but it's kind of funny because a lot of what we prepared ahead of time for you all were things that Jesse and Dan really already highlighted. So I'm going to do a high level uh, review um, reminder, and then uh, we'll get to some Q&A with these guys because uh, we want to hear from them a little bit more. Um, so at any rate, a lot of times when we think about mental strategies and sort of alleviating performance anxiety, we think about both behavioral strategies and then cognitive strategies. And so you heard Jesse especially talk a lot about sort of his routines and rituals that um, maybe he goes through. Um, I was reminded I went to the women's volleyball uh, match on Saturday and um, our libero Kylie Murr at Ohio State, who is fabulous, right? Um, does you know a ritual when she ends a match and she touches her foot on the corner of the court and leaves to go to the next match um, and sort of kind of ends it, puts it behind her and then gets prepared for the next time. Um, she will say it's sort of superstitious, but it really kind of keeps her focused on what's the next part of the game that she has to prepare for. Um, this is a picture of Alec um, Yoder. And those of you that that maybe don't, don't know Alec, he was on our, Olymp our men's Olympic team this past year and was our individual specialist on the pommel horse. And Alec was a, um, you know, has all kinds of accolades in the United States, but, um, you know, we, we've spent some time together and, you know, what I love about Alec is he talks about his, um, 
you know, routine and the way he even like sets up the pommel horse in the gym to be in the same angle as to where he would compete in a competition. Uh, he also does a lot of, if you watch him when he was competing, he would do a lot of um, kind of visualization where he would go through his exact routine before he was even going um, visually into it. But these are behavioral routines, they're imagery as well in terms of cognitive um, factors. But at the same time, it's he does the same thing before every time before he gets on that um, that horse and does that same routine that he's been doing for every match over and over again. And so again, trying to help athletes figure out what those routines are that work for them to get them to the best success and have them practice them like Dan said over and over again and ideally under pressure situations so that when they get to game time or competition time, they're more ready. Um, Sid found this cute picture. Um, you also heard both of them, especially Jesse talking about imagery and sort of visualization and, and ways in which he might calm himself down or stay focused, listening to country music, um, you know, or um, thinking about um, meditation. Dan talked about breathing. Um, others will do stretches. You know, I was thinking about even um, Steph Curry will go through pretty extensive stretching. Um, so does uh, Michael Conley with basketball. If you watch him pregame for about an hour beforehand, he's doing the same kind of stretching um, pre warm up and it happens over and over again in that same way and it gets him mentally prepared um, for uh, that performance. So those are just some other things um, that I think are uh, important. We're going to hit a few cognitive ones. Of obviously, the ones that um, Dan and, and Jesse talked mostly about was had to do with positive self talk. And Dan, I love your uh, thought of a, like sort of the red, you know, push it away and move on, right? And what what needs to be sort of passed on quickly versus what could be used in different types of sports as more significant feedback. Um, I think that, uh, you know, self-talk, a lot of it too is helping practice, you know, the positive reframe. And so getting kids to, what did Sam say? Get rid of the negative Nelly or what did you call yeah. it? Sam? Negative Ned or Nelly. Ne yeah. Negative Ned and, and listening to um, the positive, who was it, Patty? Or positive something? Pat. Yep. Positive <laughs> Pat. Um, and, and that's really um, important. And then I think this last one is just to remember at the end of the this mindset, right, that like you're supposed to have anxiety. You're supposed to be nervous. It's competition. This is a normal part of sport, right, to get your body and your mind mentally and physically prepared to be the best that you can in the sport that you're performing in. And so the more we can normalize this and sort of allow the, the flutters or allow the, the missed opportunities or the, the misses that might happen in a game or the mistakes that might happen to be moved on and that that's just a normal part of sport and that we have to learn from it and proceed forward and get better um, and focus on our improvement, and we can really be uh, much more achievement-oriented in our performance. So, um, Dan, I don't know if you have anything else to add here that you think are really good teachable um, moments right now uh, before we leave for Q&A. What are you thinking? No, I, I think just what I said before, if you're a coach watching this, uh, athletes as well, but I think a coach, find a few things that work well and really implement it consistently across time and then sort of build from there. Don't try to do everything at once. Maybe it's positive self-talk and, and you also kind of need to live it. You know, like if I'm yelling all the time and busting people down and then I give them the positive self-talk kind of presentation, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think there's part of this, like you have to live with it but also be consistent across time and, uh, and follow through these things. Uh, there's just a lot of good things out there, a lot of tools for coaches. Uh, the hard part for you is if you're a coach is time. There's so much you're, you know, so again, really think it through, kind of organize it and then follow through across time would be one. And the last, I mean, it sounds silly, but I, I'd love to show it to kids, but there's too many F-bombs in it. But Ted Lasso, if you've ever watched that show, there's so much sports psychology in it and just little coach sayings that just really make a lot of sense. Yeah, it's a great one. Isn't it fun when the truth will set you free, but it will piss you off first, right? That's yeah. a good one. So we all love some Ted Lasso. 
coaches out there who've watched it. But thank you to all of our panelists. You were amazing and shared really important things we need to be thinking about as coaches and athletes. Um, Sid, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. So if you can tell us, um, I know we have 10 minutes, so I'm going to ask you to kind of grab the most pressing three maybe and try to get our panelists to engage with them. If we have time for more, um, we can take those on. But Sid, what's one that came up from our um, amazing attendees tonight? Absolutely. So the first question that I have for everyone is how do you help athletes to keep focus during the off season? That's a great one. Dan, you're already unmuted. I feel like we got to pass to you just for the arm reaching of unmute. The, 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 a first sort of an off hand comment. Somebody once asked, how do you motivate athletes? And somebody said, you recruit motivated ones. So one is you you know, you, you're going to try to recruit people who sort of get it and who have a long-term commitment. Like we always tell people like the recruiting process is just not physical ability. It's sort of psychological and mental. The other is I think have them understand their why. I mean, that's how you started tonight off. Why are you playing high school sport? What do you want to get out of it? Are you, you know, everybody wants to win, but not everybody wants to pay a price to win. So maybe that's my slogan. And every day I'm asking the athletes once a week to tell me what they did to pay the price. And I come back to that every week of the year. What did you do this week to pay the price? We studied a great wrestling coach and his was get 1% better every week, just 1% better. And he talked about most people quit, but the 90% of the people will quit, but the 10 who don't are the ones that really excel. So you got to get 1% better, 1% better. And he just followed through on that. So some things like that could work, I think. Like that, the 1% during the off season and then sort of this, why did you do it to begin with? Okay, Jesse, what do you think? Uh, yeah, Dan pretty much covered most of it. I think it's, yeah, about finding the why. Um, and it, it is a personal thing, I guess. Obviously, some people um, want, want to achieve certain things that others might not. But uh, that's why, I guess, like for me, I, I come to Ohio State, I want to win. I want to play in the NFL. It's a, it's a personal drive, I guess. But um, also one other thing, I guess, it, it, in the team aspect, um, like using, for instance, with us last year, we, we lost the one game of the season that we, we can't lose, that we don't ever want to lose uh, to the team up north. So it's, that's, that's obviously a big motivator for everyone right there and just coaches understanding what they can use, I guess, um, to, to drive the team and the players. Yeah, so almost identifying a team goal and then having everyone identify their individual goals is a great yeah, way. Yeah, and that was, I guess that was like a, a feeling none of us enjoyed last year. And uh, I mean, even with coaches like Coach Dan, his family obviously suffer a fair bit from stuff like that. So hearing his like personal like side of things and, and how he had to deal with it as well obviously motivates you to, to not have to deal with that again. Yeah. Don, what yeah. do you think? Well, Sammy, you were going there. I mean, I think goal setting is a really great practice to do in the off season, you know, and, and sort of, okay, what is it that you want to get stronger? Do you want to get faster? Do you want to have, you know, um, more agility, you know, like oh, faster, you know, what is it that you want to do to improve your game and getting really clear on that? And then I think also finding ways perhaps to measure it, right? So that you can see progress over time, um, and see learning or strength building or speed, you know, getting slow, getting faster instead of slower. Um, those can be really great ways to keep kids engaged in different parts of um, sport tactics um, or, or techniques, right? I think both too. Yeah, I think you spoke to a good point. Part of one, what can you be working to achieve? I also think it sounds like from the three of you, there's a mental element to the off season, which is that negative self-thought, that preparation, what are my goals? All of those things kind of wrap into off seasons. So I think that could be a great time too to practice some of this stuff. Jesse, do you have a thought? Yeah, I was, I was going to say, touching on what Dawn said uh, with like measurables, um, I mean, each day in the, in the weight room in the off season, we have a competition, whether it's a like pull-ups or like a grip test, something like that. We, we compete every day. So you, you win or lose and you compete against um, other people in your position group and stuff. And it, it all gets like marked down, um, put on the big whiteboards. Like you, there's no hiding from it. So it's, yeah, it's competition. And I mean, it makes it more enjoyable. Um, and I guess makes you you know, strive to, to win, I guess. So. Yeah, I'd, I'd add yeah. something because I think Jesse's point is really important, but it's also knowing your athletes. If you have a bunch of ninth graders that are insecure, I'm not 
sure putting the whiteboard up every day. If you got Ohio State and you got a number of five-star super achievers, that's going to work really well. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do some things like that. But I was thinking if, if you, you know, time-wise too, maybe I send text out in the summer. Did you, you know, Don gets it. Hey, Don, uh, how are you doing? Would you, would you do this week to get 1% better? Text me back. So I haunt her a little, yeah. you know, as we go through. But Jesse points are really good when we know goal setting. If you have public feedback, goals work better. So, but if you have a lot of kids that are very, not very competent, you might want to give the feedback about self-improvement and not so much social comparison. When you get to elite, like Ohio State football, the social comparison makes a lot of sense. So you, as a coach, you want to think through that some. Hey, Sam, I have one more. And I don't be afraid just to have fun too in the off season, right? I mean, I think that's, a lot of times we have specialized sports so much and we grind our athletes, um, you know, to the, to core, right. And that it is the off season. And so how do they still work on their tactics, their techniques, but have a blast doing it. And how do we, as coaches kind of reframe the com- competitive nature of that environment to make it, um, you know, whether it be more social, more uh, celebratory, um, more engaging, more, you know, just mixing in different kinds of um, things as opposed to other. I remember when I was coaching soccer um, in high school years ago, I would we would have like Bundesliga, you know, competitions, right? And and the, they would have jerseys and bandanas and you know cheers and chants, and we would you know kind of have this before social media, kind of like what would have been like a TikTok or something, right? And and it was just super engaging and fun and small group oriented and and made even teams so that there was really kind of tight competition in three on three matches. And you know, so how do you figure out how to how to be able to have those fun moments that are not necessarily all grinding for the tournament or for the league championship, but um, the off season is a great time to do that, as is the summer. If, yeah. if the you know rules allow you to do it yeah and maybe get together and be teenagers or young people too and watch a game or cheer on the olympic team and just have it be a social bonding as well but i like your point on it it's got to stay fun too you know it's got to have that element of getting together making it fun and, and allowing them to bond sid what else do we have from our amazing audience yeah, so I think what I'm hearing too, a lot of what y'all are saying is answering a lot of our other questions, right? I'm hearing a lot on accountability, setting expectations early, setting goals early in the season or even in the off season. And I think that's helping us think about how do you deal with athletes that aren't you know, thinking about the future or maybe they're not bought in. How do you get them bought in? But you start early. You start by setting those expectations. Hey, this is gonna help us. Um, but I kind of wanted to bring us home we have so many good questions rolling in, but unfortunately only a little bit of time. But I wanted to bring us home with this question. As seasoned sport veterans, player or coach perspectives, what do you believe to be the most important foundational skill or mental approach to be taught to youth athletes? I would start it off and say communication. I mean, teach them how to communicate with each other. Teach them how to receive feedback, give feedback um how to vocalize what they're feeling um and, and be and be high level with that i think that's where you can really start and, and make some really good gains if i had to pick one thing yeah i, I think you know it's a really hard question it's a good question but for me mistake management how do you learn to deal with mistakes and failure and how do you learn you know, hope, hopefully you have some good times, obviously, but how do you learn to put those mistakes behind you quickly? It's not only a sports skill, but it's a life skill. You might apply for a job and not get it, or you might not get the grade you want on a test. And the environment today for kids is so social comparison oriented. Everybody's ranked and rated, et cetera. And we know kids staying at the long haul for self-satisfaction, you know, they're very competitive, but they want to be, be the best they can be. So if you don't learn how to deal with mistakes, you're in big trouble. Communication, yeah. mistake management. Jesse, what you got? I was just going to say, I think communication is probably the biggest one as well. Uh, being able to yeah, speak with your teammates, with your coaches, um, and feel comfortable with that. I mean, it comes to the coach as well, being able to like speak with the, uh, their players and 
and build that relationship, I guess. Um, no one wants to be yeah playing for someone that they they can't have a relationship with and um, yeah, it makes them feel uncomfortable at times. So uh, definitely, yeah, communication is probably uh, the highest one for me. Yeah, communicate, build that relationship. I like it. All right, Dawn, take us home. What's that skill? I just think it's funny how it's communication, but it's relationships. But I guess what I would say is like teaching kids how to ask for help, right, or support, um, whether it be, you know, in their sport performance or, you know, and being okay to like go seek that information out or just in life in general. So, you know, making it more acceptable to say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Q, I know this is your expertise. Can you help me with this? Or, hey, you know, coach, this, you know, this is, I think our coaches in some ways today, and I don't know where they have gotten this, but feel like the, the athletes need to just come to them and talk to them, right? And they should just feel free to come and open them. My door's always open. They should come talk to me. And coaches are definitely sort of have that philosophy, which albeit, you know, maybe it's, they give off all the other nonverbals that suggest that they don't want you to come talk to them. But um, I think, you know, helping kids figure out how to navigate the adults in their lives and the peers in their lives and being able to talk through, which is communication, but then seek support and guidance and feedback when they're struggling. I think both on and off the field is really important. So, yeah, I love that. Asking for help, learning how to do that early and appropriately and to the right people. And I think in there, you also said a go to where the kids are as well, which is a really important one too for our coaches on the call. So we want to give a huge thank you to our panelists. And here's what we're going to ask of you to all of our attendees, you know, as you're giving your virtual claps and thank yous in the chat. Um, we're also going to ask you to grab your phone and tell us how it went tonight. You know, what's something you took away, something you might want to still continue to learn because that's going to inform our coach beyond work. Um, if you are not a QR code, want to take this on your phone, we're going to get it in your inbox tonight. So you can either do it tonight or first thing tomorrow, but please, please, this is really valuable for us. It also allows us to know what coaches and where kind of we're reaching across the state. And so if you could please just take this evaluation we would absolutely appreciate it. So I'm going to give you another 10 seconds here to grab it because Q and I like seeing how it how it went, what you learned and took away. Um, if you've grabbed that and Sid will drop it in the chat as well, we want to cue you to our next amazing event that's coming up. So on Tuesday, November 22nd, we are going to have Jim Trestle in the house. Uh, we were initially going to have this as a webinar, but he is able to be in town this night. And so we want to welcome and invite all of you to join us at the Fawcett Center to hear Jim Trussell, who is the best on this topic, talk, topic um, talk to us about fostering a positive team environment. And so if you're interested, this will also accompany some of uh, your emails that you've shared with us. We'll get this out to you. Um, space is limited. We will have a cap on this. So if you want to be there Tuesday of Thanksgiving week, um, please go ahead and sign up. Um, and then if you have any more questions about Coach Beyond or want to talk to Q&I or get in touch with some of our guest speakers, reach out to us and we'll try to get you in touch or get your questions answered. Um, let's give a huge in the chat and then from Q&I because we're kind of the only ones and Sid, um, big thank you to our guest speakers, Jesse, Dan, and Dawn. You are amazing. Jesse, we thank you for your time. Go Bucks this weekend. Thank you. Bucks. Thanks yeah. for having me. <laughs> I think we're all a Jesse fan now and we'll be cheering for you. Uh, Dan and Dawn, your expertise was invaluable tonight. Um, and folks, we hope to see you on November 22nd. Sid, appreciate your help monitoring the chat and all things text. Um, have a great night, everybody. Thanks for being on.